Hello and welcome to another episode of the Fully Charged News Show. And now I've said it before, I'll say it again, the speed and impact of the transition from combustion to electric grand transport is going to be rapid and profound. Now just recently Stellantis, the company who made that car behind me, who own Chrysler, Alfa Romeo, Citroen, Fiat, Jeep, Maserati, Peugeot, Opel and Vauxhall, basically the supergroup who now own 14 different car makers, have just announced that the van manufacturing plant at Ellesmere Port near Liverpool in the UK is being transitioned to making 100% electric vehicles. Now, in the main, these are going to be small and medium-sized delivery vans. They are investing £100 million, or around €116 million, Euros, or $138 million, in the plant, and the long-term aim is to make the entire manufacturing process 100% carbon neutral by 2050. In fact, globally, by 2025, Stellantis will invest a whopping €30 billion Euros in electrification. Its aim is that low emission vehicles should account for 70% of sales in Europe and 30% of sales in the United States by 2030. But what the story from the van plant in Ellesmere Port means is that delivery vans, of which there are over 4 million on the road in the UK, will be among the first vehicles to be 100% electric. And Stellantis have said that Vauxhall in the UK will only be making 100% electric vehicles by 2028. Literally, they are stopping making any combustion engines. That is a huge shift for a very long established car company. Now, while the media and marketing focus is always on cars, it's going to be delivery vans that have the really big, first big impact. In five years' time, you'll actually notice when one of the old dirty delivery vans brings a parcel to you or drives past you in the street, the electric ones will just be normal. All the anxieties and misgivings companies and drivers had about them will be a distant, misty memory. Here's why that is the case. In 2019, 50% of all vans used professionally in the UK were used within 15 miles of their base, 1.5 miles. How much range has the average delivery van got that are being sold at the moment? About 150 to 200 miles on average. So range anxiety is nonsense. It's a fossil fuel funded myth. Now, the good news is that we will be tackling these myths and showing off loads and loads of electric cars and vans like these at Fully Charged Outside in under 50 days' time. What the what? Ah, now, now, OK, we're British, so we don't usually do self-promotion. We do a little bit on Fully Charged, but not much. But we are so excited about what's in store at Farnborough in September. It's, it's going to be the biggest, the biggest electric car and clean technology exhibition ever and it's going to be fun and fascinating engaging and entertaining and it's outside so it's super covid safe and every car van bus truck bike scooter and possibly planes that are electric are going to be there an incredible array of technology for the home will be on display and amazing stuff for kids and food yes actual food and drink will be available and places to sit down or stand up and covered spaces in case it's a little moist which it very rarely is in September in the UK. Plus amazing speakers in more than 50 live sessions, challenging discussions about EVs, tech, renewables, charging, batteries, hydrogen, oh my word, the list, seriously, the list goes on and on. It's not to be missed. The last week of the British school holidays, what a way to end the summer break. Perfect location, loads of easy public transport, loads of parking space. And there will be test drives too, but a limited number. So the earlier you get your tickets, the better chance you have of having a go. I'm just saying, no pressure. And as it's been so long, I don't think it's inappropriate to remind fully charged live fans, myself included, what we've all been missing. Let's have a reminder. Roll VT! The Fully Charged Live shows are back with a bang and we're just a little bit excited. Uh, okay, actually, we're unbelievably excited. Kicking off with Fully Charged Outside at Farnborough International on the 3rd, 4th and 5th of September this year, which will feature every electric car currently available in the UK, as well as electric bikes, electric scooters, electric skateboards, electric motorbikes, larger electric vehicles like trucks and buses and loads more, and of course, an incredible array of clean energy solutions for your home.
We are really looking forward to seeing you there. And in other relevant and slightly optimistic electric car related news from the UK, Nissan have announced they are building a battery gigafactory in Sunderland to support the increased production of electric cars at their Sunderland plant, where all the Nissan Leafs sold in Europe are made. Now this whole plant was under threat if the current administration didn't support it and come up with a, if they came up with a lousy Brexit deal, it would have gone. But I'm assuming that was managed and Nissan have announced they are investing one billion pounds in the new battery battery plant. Now, just to put that in some sort of context, the Tesla Gigafactory in Nevada has so far cost $5 billion and it's still not finished. In fact, they've only built 30% of the total planned structure and are currently producing 35 gigawatt hours of battery capacity a year. The final production capacity of the Gigafactory is planned to be 100 gigawatt hours a year. Now, the new Nissan plant in Sunderland is due to produce 9 gigawatt hours a year, but that's still a massive leap forward from where we are now, which is kind of nearly nothing. I mean, 9 gigawatt hours is enough batteries for around 180,000 50 kilowatt electric car battery packs, so it's a good start. Next story, billionaires in space. <gasps> no, 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 I shouldn't be cynical. It's better than them spending their insane wealth on laser-guided death drones, but maybe less good than spending on something a little more helpful to a lot of people suffering from the immediate effects of more and more extreme weather. Now, this is anecdotal, but I was in London the other day, and in the afternoon we had over a month's worth of rain in one hour. We were driving on a freeway slash motorway flyover, you know, like up in the air, and somehow even that had about a foot and a half of water to plough through. British drains are not built for that kind of rain. Everything got blocked up and flooded. And I'm very glad we were in an electric car as they don't conk out in deep water like so many combustion cars. OK, there's a bit of a goad, a bit of a dig. I don't care. Suck it up. Now, we have witnessed rain and thunder like this before, maybe once or twice in my lifetime in the UK. But this sort of super heavy rain is more common somewhere tropical, rarely in Hampstead or Richmond, where there was quite a lot of localised, really sudden flooding. And they've had truly horrendous flooding and loss of life in Germany and Belgium this week. German weather experts said that the rains over the region in the past 24 hours had been totally unprecedented. We're going to have to get used to and able to cope with more and more extreme weather events, whatever we do. And then there's bonkers heat. I mean, I've been in Seattle at this time of year and I wore a raincoat every day and it was a little bit chilly. The same goes for Vancouver but they have just recorded the highest temperatures ever since they were settled by Europeans and the highest temperatures by a huge margin. Now, I'm the first person to highlight the distinction between weather and climate, but having once experienced a temperature of 50 degrees centigrade in the Australian desert in 1990, let me tell you, that is seriously toasty. Temperatures in rainy coastal northwestern USA reached 54 degrees centigrade or 130 degrees Fahrenheit for American viewers who use old fashioned measurements. That is unspeakably hot. Even in Seattle, which I always think of as having the same weather as Manchester in the UK, it went over 40 degrees centigrade or around 103 Fahrenheit. And now there's huge fires all over California, again, and the worst drought on record, again, which is after the last worst drought on record. And daily temperatures in sub-Saharan Africa are becoming intolerable, which leads to food shortages, societal breakdown, civil war, and of course, mass migration. So I think it's fair to say there's an element of urgency for the human race to stop burning stuff. And I look forward to the comments attempting to differentiate between weather and climate. I'm sure you'll correct me. Next story, 2020, a year that will be remembered for one thing, but there's a slightly more optimistic footnote to add to the litany of disasters we've all lived through in the last 18 months. More than 260 gigawatts of renewable energy capacity was added globally in 2020, beating the previous record by almost 50%. Now, to put that in a bit of context, the new nuclear power installation at Hinkley Point C that's being built at the moment will have a generating capacity of 3 gigawatts. 
Another bit of context is that the maximum electricity consumption period in the UK, when we basically use the most electricity at any time of the year, is generally an early evening in November when everyone in the country turns on everything because they're so depressed. We use around 62 gigawatts at any one time. That's the maximum peak. So 260 gigawatts is fairly chunky, as you can understand. Nowhere near enough, but the ramp up of the installation is rapid and global. And here's an important subheading. More than 80% of all new electricity generating capacity added last year was renewable, with solar and wind accounting for 91% of new renewables. That means we're not building as many new coal, nuclear and gas plants. Most of the new installation is renewable and as at the end of 2020 that total figure for renewable energy generating capacity was 2,799 gigawatts according to data released by the International Renewable Energy Agency, IRENA. Now the total global electricity supply, what we can generate at maximum chat if you like, is around 8,500 gigawatts. And all the proje uh, projections suggest that renewables will overtake fossil fuel generation by 2040. So there are some reasons to be mildly cheerful. Next story, Tesla, the car company that thousands of people have stated again and again for the last decade would be a flop, a failure, would crash and burn, would never make a profit, was doomed from the outset, was an international disgrace, was building cars no one wanted, was a basket case, hopeless, a fantasy for rich people, oh my life, that list goes on and on. Anyway. They've just made record profits and sold more cars than ever before, and it's all absolutely amazing. And I've now seen some footage of someone driving a Tesla Model S plaid with a yoke steering wheel, and the driver says he loves it and pre prefers it, and it's amazing. So it, basically, everything Tesla does is amazing. The cars are amazing. Elon Musk is amazing. SpaceX is amazing. The supercharger network is amazing. The over-the-air software updates are amazing. The autopilot autonomous driving abilities are amazing. Along wide, straight roads in America. Sorry, sorry, sorry. I was trying to be totally positive, not the least critical of Tesla, for this week anyway. Moving on, on to car news from the tippy-tip top end. The amazing Croatian startup Rimac and the legendary insanely expensive supercar makers Bugatti are joining forces. According to Matej Rimac, who is a bit of a legend, and he's only 33, I mean, what this man has done is incredible, and he gets one millionth of the press attention of Mr. Musk, who is brilliant and fascinating and amazing. Anyway, Matty Rimac said in a recent press release, both companies have agreed to pool our knowledge, technologies and assets with the goal of creating very special projects in the future. Very exciting and I think extremely relevant regarding how the electrification of transport has opened up new markets, new companies and indeed new countries to being involved. I mean, Croatia has got a population of 4 million and literally zero history of ever making cars. Now, Matej Rimac and the incredible team behind the hypercars, and they're mostly Croatian people, they, they, they have founded and sustained a truly groundbreaking company in Croatia. An amazing story. And although I've met Matej, and he's a lovely fella, and we've featured the cars on Fully Charged, we have never done an actual test drive. I hope now, or very soon, that we can eventually get Jack Scarlett behind the wheel of a Rimac. I've heard they're quite fast, so it would be a waste for me to have a go in one. Although I dare say there are one or two viewers who might watch, uh, enjoy watching me scream and burst into tears. But here's a final electric vehicle story I'm very, very excited about. Rivian are going to launch sales of the Rivian electric trucks in Europe in 2022. Hello! Oh my life. So the, the US startup funded and backed and funded by uh, Amazon and Ford, among others, wants to sell its electric vehicles in Europe from the beginning of 2022. Now, and that's very, very good news. Now, there are also increasing numbers of rumours circulating that they are looking for a, a, a site for a European based factory in either Germany, Hungary or the UK. But Rivian Trucks, incredible range, mind-boggling towing capacity, amazing off-road capability, tough as a sack of rocks. If you are interested to see them in action and you haven't seen the Apple TV series Long Way Up with our mate Charlie Borman and some actor chap he called Ewan McGregor, it's worth a watch. They rode two Harley Davidson electric bikes for thousands of miles through South America, but they were supported and backed up by two Rivian Trucks. 
Rivian in Europe is exciting. Having seen one in the flesh at our live show in Austin, Texas last year, I can state with certain knowledge that they are really, really amazing. Oh, and look at that. I mentioned Fully Charged Live in Texas. <laughs> and there's going to be a new show in Farnborough very, very soon. I don't know if I've mentioned that enough. And then in Amsterdam, and then in Austin, and Sydney next year. So make sure you're there, wherever you are. And that's it for today's bulletin. I don't want to drone on anymore. I'm not even going to mention Patreon, except in this way, because I'm mentioning some fantastic Patreons who support Fully Charged for $10 a month or more, and they are Michael Thoman, Richard Hajzuk, John Dunlop, Marcus Cormell, Phil Tordoff, Sean Walsh, Shannon Farrell, Nick Horton, Jose Erelaga, Edwin Cortine, Steve Savory, Michael Rabinsky, Susan Graves, Imogen Cox, Niels Bolt Wilson, Dibs, Andre Horstadt Solberg, Miguel Grolet, Ron Spencer, Thomas Nyrud, Dietmar Wenzel, and Lel Trogden. Thank you all so much. Even if I have made a right mess pronouncing your names, we are hugely grateful for your support, and it's what keeps this show on the road. Thank you very much. There's loads more episodes coming very, very soon. And uh, I really hope you see them. Please do subscribe to Fully Charged and all the usual stuff. And as always, if you have been, thank you for watching.